Welcome, Christ community. It's good to worship together today. I want to just call this out at this very moment. This is weird. Um, I'm in a room with 10 people. Uh, and the truth of the matter is we wanted to be, be very, very sure to follow all of the, the guidelines that we've been given by the CDC. And so I want you to know that we are following those guidelines. And, and so you'll see that our band is a little bit smaller than, than it was last week. But the joy of the Lord is with us. And I just want to really encourage you today that in this weirdness, you might be sitting on a couch or watching, um, uh, who knows, on your computer in your dining room. But what I want you to do right now is I want you to begin to think about engaging now in worship. And so that means if you need to take notes, if you need to, uh, if you need to pull out a journal or make sure you get your Bible out. But as well, what I want you to do, especially in these next few moments, is please sing. I, I encourage you to turn your TV up if you're watching on your TV or turn your headphones up and, and just engage in this worship together. I think that one of the things that I've loved this week is hearing from our own Jeannie Lucas, who has said, isn't this a wonderful, amazing time? We're reminded that God owns the internet. And so remember right now, around the world, people are celebrating and worshiping God through technology, and we are gonna do it today. So hear these words as our call to worship from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and, and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works of our God. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul say 
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall. join our voices together and in unity let us proclaim the words of the Apostles Creed as a proclamation of our faith in God we're gonna sing it together you ready our Father everlasting the all-creating one and God Almighty your Holy Spirit conceiving Christ the Son and Jesus our Savior I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for i believe in the name of jesus our judge and our defender suffered and crucified Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in you I believe you rose again God the Father, 
I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus Let us bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we declare to you that we believe in you. Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior, Holy Spirit, our constant comforter, our triune God, you are the everlasting one. We gather as your created, redeemed image bearers, your beloved bride, the church. Our minds are focused on you, and with hearts we adore you. With unity of spirit, we declare we trust you at all times. In these disruptive, turbulent, fearful, and uncertain times, our great God, we look to you. You are our sovereign God. And this moment in history does not take you by surprise, nor is this uncharted territory for you. O oh, gracious Lord, you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. You alone are our good shepherd. In you there is abundant life with no lack. You lead us to green pastures and beside still waters. You restore anxious and weary souls. And yes, even in the darkest valleys, we will not fear, for you are right here with us. You are always attentive to us. You know us by name, and you hear us when we call. You provide for us. You guide us, you watch behind us, and you go before us. We find safety, comfort, peace, and joy in your omnipotent and loving nail-scarred hands. So we cast our cares on you this day, for you care for us, knowing that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As your children, we come to you with humble hearts, asking you to protect our congregation, our city, our nation, and the global community in this time of global pandemic. We ask for your loving intervention, your tender care, your mercy protection on the most physically and emotionally and economically vulnerable among us. Gracious Lord, grant to our medical researchers and healthcare providers protection from illness, Give them in your grace extra strength and resilience. We pause to pray for our local, city, state, and national governmental leaders. We pray for our business leaders, that you would protect them from illness and grant to them great wisdom and supernatural strength in the midst of so many demands and so much stress. O oh, Jehovah Rapha, our great healer, we pray, heal our land. And as a congregation, we pray that you would provide and protect us in this ever-changing and in the difficult days ahead. Help us, empower us, encourage us to joyfully and sacrificially be the eyes, the ears, the hands, the feet of Jesus to each other and to our neighbors. And teach us to pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Let us pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ Community Church, it is so good to be together, even electronically. Uh, If you're like me, you're feeling like this past week was full of anxiety, uncertainty, and all kinds of craziness. And yet I want to make this clear to all of us uh, here. We believe deeply as a church staff that this moment God is going to use for his church, for his mission, and for the glory of his son, Jesus. And we have nothing to fear. And we believe deeply and wholeheartedly that God has prepared Christ's community for this moment. We are not alone. We are not ill-equipped. And we believe with God's help, this can be our finest hour as a church family. So let's commit together, shall we, to be the church where God has placed us this week. Okay? Okay. A couple of normal things that we're going to talk about uh, probably every week. Uh, The first is uh, our family devotional. We put together a little guide for you to use with your families as you uh, process this worship service. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. For now, I just want you to know that if you want to get that guide for this worship service, there should be a link in the Facebook post if you're watching there, or you can jump to your email, and our weekly update email that was sent on Saturday should have a link for you. There are uh, fill-in-the-blanks in that family devotional, and you're not going to want to miss that. So, so pull that up uh, if you'd like to participate in that uh, during this worship service. The second thing is prayer requests. We want to keep praying for you, and we want to pray specifically for you right now. There should be a, a button on our website where you can submit a prayer requests electronically. We'll get those this week. Keep, keep those coming. The next is uh, give. Please continue to give generously. Uh, you can give online. We have a whole web page on our website. You can click on that give button. It'll give you lots of instructions on how you can give. For those of you who normally write checks, that's fine. You can continue to do that. But please make sure to mail those to our multi-site office so that we're getting those in a timely way. Uh, the uh, last thing is uh, our take a photo, our Facebook post. Take a photo. We want to see how we're all worshiping together. Uh, and uh, if you take a photo, even if you're in your pajamas, we swear we won't judge you. Uh, let us see how you're engaging with this worship service. Take a picture of whoever is with you and uh, post that on Facebook and you can tag love over fear. And that's just another way we can engage and be together, even though we're not physically together. Uh, with all of that in mind, let's continue to worship in song. As we continue singing this morning, I want to invite you to, to, to just drop everything and, and, and really engage in this moment as we prepare to hear from God's word and what he has to say to us. Let's sing these words as an act of worship together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus. 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Father, we come just stating this exact thing, that we build our lives on your love. And as those who build our lives on your love, we open and think on your word. As we open its pages, we ask that you would open our ears to hear what you have to say to us. Open our minds to learn of you and open our hearts to trust in you. We pray all of this in the matchless and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 40. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
You pull up to the party, and instantly you know you do not belong. You don't know how you thought you could pull this off, but you, inst- you, you know you're out of place. The house is bigger than you thought it would be. Everything is fancier, and, and, and you think it would be so easy to turn around and just walk away. And yet there you are, already regretting your life choices, and you knock. After what seems like days, somebody finally opens up the house. You go in, you begin to scan the room, and you, you recognize almost everyone there, but you feel out of place with all of them. You, you don't feel like you, you fit even, even a little bit as you, as you see them. And like, again, why, why did you do this to yourself? Like every, everyone you see is more. They're, they're smarter than you. They're more educated than you. They have more money than you, more talent, more beauty. They are just more. And you even assume in that moment that they have more of their junk altogether than you do. You fix your shirt. You know, you, you try to brush your hair. You're so un- underdressed. Everyone looks so perfect, but you. Why did you even come to this stupid party? And so you glance longingly back at the exit, but as you do so, the host's eyes catch yours. So now you're stuck. And you can't help but notice the the look of surprise on their face because you weren't, you know, exactly invited to this thing. But thankfully, they get distracted by someone better than you, and you're spared that awkward conversation for now. So you, you take one more look. Like, there's got to be somebody here, a safe face for you to retreat to. And as you do, you get the unmistakable feeling from everyone there that they know. You don't know how they know. You don't even know how you know that they know, but you know they know. That, that thing about you, whatever it is that you've kept hidden for so long, that area of darkness or shame or woundedness, they know. And now they're staring. You hear the condescending whisper, somebody points, and then a laugh. And now everybody's laughing. Now, typically, this is the point in which we wake up, Right? Like cold sweat, panicked, like it was just a dream. But that, that feeling like in the, the pit of my stomach is shame. Shame is the worst, isn't it? Not, not just the, the, the feeling that you've, you've done something wrong or regret or guilt that you did something wrong, but that you are something wrong and that you'll never be enough, never good enough. No one could want you. No one could love you, you piece of garbage. When's the last time you felt that way? Some of you probably feel that way right now. Could be as a result of something you did, something that somebody did to you, or just that unending feeling of lack that you don't measure up. It's awful, isn't it? Kurt Thompson, in his great little book, The Soul of Shame, I'd highly recommend this one, he he brings psychology and theology and neurology all to bear on this really important subject. We're still... We're still hoping uh, that we'll be able to be with him on April 23rd. Uh, You can sign up for that. We'll keep you posted on that. We're hoping that that will happen. Uh, But listen to what he writes. He says, shame is the primary tool that evil leverages, out of which emerges everything that we would call sin. As such, it is actively, intentionally at work, both with and between individuals. Its goal is to disintegrate any and every system it targets, Be that one's personal story, family, marriage, friendship, church, school, community, business, or political system. Its power lies in its subtlety and its silence. And it will not be satisfied until all hell breaks loose. Literally. Shame destroys. It is is actively out to get you. It loves the dark. It loves to hide. And it would love to destroy you and everything that you hold dear. And this woman, who just walked into that party, knows exactly what it feels like. If you haven't already, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Because this this isn't just any party. This This is a party at the house of a Pharisee and with all the kinds of people that a Pharisee would invite, you know? Okay, and and a Pharisee, they're like the religious of the religious, the ultimate rule keeper, 
They have their lives together and they know it and they're proud of it and everybody knows it. And the guy's name here is Simon. It's not Simon Peter, of course. It's Simon the Pharisee. And, and this banquet that he's throwing, it's a, it's a really big deal. The banquet was a place of honor and respect in that culture, a place with, with manners and customs. And so what, what is this woman doing there? For she is a sinner. We don't even know her name. All we know is that her life is a mess. Some have assumed that she's a prostitute. That's possible, certainly. Others, because of the language here in the text, have thought maybe she's somehow in league with their Roman oppressors. It doesn't really matter. Regardless of what it is, it is public and it is ugly and everybody knows her shame. And she is universally despised by everyone in that room. Would you go to a party like this? No way. So why is she there? It's because she heard a rumor. Jesus might be there. Wait, but why would Jesus go to a party like this, right? What's, what's his deal? Why, why is he there? But you, you got to think about this. So, so, like, Jesus is the guest of honor in Simon's house. And this is a really, really big deal, right? Like, this could be Jesus' big break. I mean, you kind of want to say, like, don't blow it, Jesus. Like, you're hanging out with religious royalty. I mean, Jesus is still a kind of a nobody at this point. He's up and coming, but he's, he's a rookie of a rabbi, a poor carpenter. And this is his chance to get in with the popular kids. And we feel the tension mounting in this room. Because Simon is exactly the kind of person that you would think Jesus would accept and respect and almost even kiss up to. And this woman, you would expect him to despise culturally in that moment. And so Luke is building this tension for us and he wants us to wrestle with the question, how is Jesus going to respond to them? And how are they going to respond to Jesus? So, so picture the room with me. They're, they're reclining, the men are, reclining at a dining table. Uh, we picture table and chairs, but it's probably something more like this. And so their heads are sort of leaning in towards the table. Their feet are sticking out. And in comes this, this woman, this, this sinner, this unwanted person. And she comes carrying an expensive jar of ointment, which would have been possibly a family heirloom, something that she had saved years to be able to purchase, her prized possession. And she walks in, and I don't know if she even recognizes the, the condescending whispers, the stares, the laughter, the people pointing her out in her shame. And I don't, I don't even know if she knows what she came to do. But upon seeing Jesus in complete self-abandon, she washes his feet which is not as weird as it sounds for them. I mean, it'd be pretty weird for us if I were to walk into a party today and just start washing some stranger's feet. Like, you would never have me back. It'd be disgusting. I would never do that, right? We, we wouldn't even think about that. But culturally for them, I mean, if you're walking around in sandals in the desert all day, your feet are going to get nasty and somebody's got to do this job. And besides, it's probably the only part of Jesus that she can reach. But what's unusual is that she uses her tears, her kisses, her most prized possession, and even her hair as a towel. For upon seeing Jesus, she weeps. She is a sinner, and she knows it. And Simon is outraged. Look what he says in verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man, Jesus, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. What sort of woman this is? Such interesting language, isn't it? Have you ever been sorted? Like, of course you have. Like, we sort people all the time. We put them into the categories, categories that, that push them sort of away, that sort of distinguish who's in and who's out, makes us feel better about our judgments, right? He's old, she's ugly, they're stupid, this person's overreacting. He's that sort of man. 
She's that sort of woman. It's a statement of shame. Do you feel her shame in this moment? You know, I can't help but read the story and feel my own shame, right? Because we all, we all deal with it. We all wrestle deeply with our own shame. In fact, Brene Brown, who's such a brilliant thinker and writer on this subject, she says basically, like, you as a human, you either wrestle with shame or you are a sociopath. Like, those are our options, people. It's not great. In fact, she even refers to our fight against shame as our defense against the dark arts. I was a Harry Potter fan. I love that. Similarly, Kurt Thompson writes, to be human is to be infected. And it is a virus so much worse than corona. And we know it. It's universal. It's fatal. Every one of us has it, and yet we continue to try to hide it and live behind it. We walk around spreading it to others, making it even worse. We're desperate for a cure, and we do anything we possibly can to quiet the pain that we feel. Shame from your past, if you only knew what I did. Shame from something dark in your present. I can't believe I did that, said that, feel that, thought that. Shame around something that someone has done to you, or again, just that unending sense that you are not enough. It's not just the feeling that you did something wrong, but that you are something wrong. And I think in this this current moment, like things are ready for shame to just bubble up for us, right? Because we feel the the shame of our fears. We feel the the shame within our isolation where it continues to to brew. And we we feel the shame in our our lack of control or, you know, even the shame that we have from all the toilet paper hoarded in in your closet, right? We feel shame. And it makes us retreat to anything that we can to quiet the voices. A little more food, a little more alcohol, a little more money, a little more sex, a little more control, a little more work, a little more distraction. But we only end up with a little more emptiness and a little more shame. And the last thing shame wants is exactly what shame needs the most, to be seen. To be, to, be, to be exposed, to be, to be known. And this is one of the biggest challenges I think that face us right now as a people. We are isolated and shame loves isolation. And, and we're afraid and we are insecure and all of these things around us keep pushing us deeper and deeper into our shame because it's so easy to hide. And yet this woman, in the midst of her shame, instead of hiding she goes to Jesus, which is the exact opposite of what you'd expect. Jesus knows everything. Jesus is the holy God. He sees all, but she knows Jesus is the kind of person shamed people feel free to come to. Don't miss that. That's the first thing I want us to remember. Jesus is the kind of person shamed people feel free to come to. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense Jesus knows everything about this woman, the things that everybody else knows, and the things about you and I that we would never tell another human. He sees all of it. But she goes to him. And yet, how many of us feel like we have to clean ourselves up for Jesus? That we have to make ourselves a little bit more presentable? I mean, even in this day, right, the things that we feel, we, we don't feel like we can bring them fully to God to say, Jesus, you know what, I'm really disappointed right now. Jesus, I'm, I'm really feeling out of control. I'm feeling, I'm feeling trapped or isolated. I'm feeling afraid. We feel like we have to sort of sanitize our prayers and bring them to him. But what we see in this story is that this woman brings all of it, everything she's feeling, all of her shame, And she gives it to Jesus because she knows Jesus is the kind of person shamed people feel free to come to. Why? Go back back to the story. So this, this Pharisee, he also hurls shame at Jesus. I mean, that's essentially what he does, right? If he were a prophet, like if he were really somebody, like he would know. And the funny thing there is he's not, I don't think he's actually mad that the woman is here. He's just mad that Jesus doesn't know how to judge her. But this all, Luke tells us, he said to himself. Of course, that's not going to stop Jesus from getting involved, right? Because Jesus knows what he's thinking in this moment. Look what, look what Jesus says in verse 40. 
And Jesus, answering, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon answered, say it, teacher. And so Jesus tells a little story. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? I mean, it's a brilliant story because it's so obvious. Like, we, we know already the answer to that question, but let me just help us a little bit. So denarii was roughly about a day's wage. And so, you know, you have one person who owes a, about two months' wages, which think about your, you know, paycheck over two months. That's a lot of money. It's a big debt. Nobody wants that. But this other one owes roughly two years. Like, that is a lot of debt. Neither can pay. Both are forgiven. And so who's going to love more? Who's going to have more joy at the end of that? Who is going to have deeper gratitude? I mean, even Simon knows the answer to that one. And so verse 44, then turning toward the woman, Jesus said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I I love the little detail that Luke gives us, that that Jesus turns toward the woman and speaks to Simon. Like he he looks at her, right, with with tenderness and compassion, perhaps like she has never before in her entire life ever seen, right? That somebody wants her, somebody loves her, somebody cares for her. He looks at her and says, Simon, man, I wish you were more like her. And just think about that in that culture. To you, a Pharisee, I wish you were more like this sinner. To you, a man in that culture, I wish you were more like this woman. But Jesus stands with her. He advocates for her. He is there to stand with her. He turns toward her. I love how Dorothy Sayers describes Jesus. This comes out in her book, Are Women Human?, it's her own sort of you know, fight and, and discussion around women, the rights and, and dignity of, of women. She was way ahead of her time. Listen to what she says. It's so beautiful. She says, Perhaps it is no wonder that the women were first at the cradle and last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There never has been such another A prophet and teacher who never nagged at them, never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made jokes about them, never treated them as the the women, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without querulousness and praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no ax to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them and was completely unselfconscious. That is our Jesus. He stands with her. And I, I want to be like that, and I want to be a part of a church like that, right? Who stands, who advocates, not just for the, the perfect people with their perfect little lives, But for those on the outside, those who are powerless, those who are hurting, those who are shamed, the sinner, for Jesus alone can turn our brokenness into an asset. That's that's the second thing I want us to take note of here in this story. Jesus alone can turn our messes, yours and mine, and make something beautiful out of it actually turn it into an asset. I mean, what he, what he says here is truly astounding. He says, Simon, I wish you were more like her than 47. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, he doesn't minimize them, but they're forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And please don't miss this. The the amount of of shame that you feel, the amount of regret or inadequacy or brokenness or however you would describe it, the more you have of that. Jesus says, if you bring it to him, the more love you may end up having for him. Whatever you think might disqualify you from his love, 
Whatever you think kind of keeps you separated out from his love may actually be the thing that brings you closer. If you bring it to him, your divorce, your addiction, your affair, your anger, your abortion, those words you wish so badly you could get back, the the regret that you very well could take with you to your grave, that unending voice that's always screaming, you will never be enough. Your, your fear, your, your loneliness, your depression, your doubt, your inadequacy, all of that when brought to Jesus in faith with confession and repentance leads to greater love. Love that a Pharisee like Simon, that a self-righteous person like so many of us will never be able to experience. Of course, I'm not saying that having a sordid past is a good thing or That your shame will just instantly go away or that we should sin all the more so that we can love Jesus all the more. Of course not. But that place of great, great shame in your life, you know the place. I know it for me. What Jesus is saying is that if you bring that to him, that can be the most fertile soil for God's love. And that he, he longs to plant that deep within you, to root it deep within your heart, to water it, to prune it, and to make it grow. And, and when we do that in the context of community, I mean, that's kind of like pulling the weeds out for one another. And that's going to be really hard in this season. We've got to think creatively about that because do not isolate. Shame loves isolation. And so, you know, maybe we just need to rediscover like that our phones were originally invented to make phone calls, Right? Or are there ways of technology or a small, tiny groups of people t- to meet one, with one another? Shame loves the dark. We need one another in this moment. Because only, only he, only God, can turn our brokenness into an asset. And I just imagine the kind of garden God could create right here for his love. It's crazy, right? So Simon is rebuked. The woman is praised. In verse 48, and Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? I mean, if they were mad before, now they're fuming. Nobody can forgive sins but God. They know it. And Jesus knows it. And so what Jesus is doing in this moment is claiming to be that God who can forgive sins. And that he looks deep into this woman's eyes, the the God incarnate, the God who made everything, who still rules over his universe, who holds everything by the word of his power. This same God looks her in the eyes and says, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, and this is the last thing, Jesus wants to trade his peace for your shame. Jesus wants to trade his peace to to give that to you and and in return receive your shame. This is what Jesus came to do. And we often focus only on half of it, right? That yes, we know Jesus came and died on the cross to, to take all of our shame, all of our brokenness, all of our pain and regret and all of those things upon him. And we praise him for that. But yet in that transaction, He takes all of that and he gives us all of his worthiness. So everything good and beautiful and true about Jesus, everything holy and wonderful and beautiful, it's given to us. So that even when we don't feel like enough, he can be enough for us. And it is available to anyone who comes to him just like this woman. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So how do we respond? I just want to mention three things quickly as I close. First of all, we've got to receive it. Maybe that's obvious to you. And yet every one of us, I think we know this, we're all waging a defense against the dark arts of shame in our life. And Jesus says, come to me. With open arms, he welcomes us, all that we are, all that we have, that, that, that if you're with Jesus, God has no judgment left for you. Only mercy and grace. And he can make you enough. And for some of us, maybe that's for the very first time. 
that you're in a place where you need hope. You need to understand the things that are going on around you and within you, and you hear Jesus calling. He wants to take your shame. Confess your sins, and in faith, receive his forgiveness. And even even if you've done that, church, that is our daily posture moving forward, that we do this over and over and over again. And again, in in this moment of potential isolation, of fear, of all the things that we experience, temptation for us could be at an all time high. And shame would love nothing more than to use this to destroy you and the people you love. Don't let it daily say, Jesus, take my shame. And let me have your peace. I need it. I'm hungry for it. Receive it. Second, extend it. I mean, as recipients of such extravagant love, we extend his love to others. And things are going to get a little bit crazy right now. Some of you are going to be stuck at home with people you like some of the time, right? For a really long time, we need to move forward, not with shame as a tool, but with grace, with gentleness. Or even thinking about, you know, learning how to to handle clients and customers or coworkers all now virtually. I mean, things are going to be on edge and we're all experiencing this in such different ways. We need extra grace, extra compassion. And you can, because God already calls you enough. And as, as his follower and as his church, don't you want to be the kind of people where shame people feel free to come to? Don't you want to be the kind of people who stands with those who are outcasts, who, who gets to witness God taking the messes of our life and making it into something beautiful, who see that transaction of shame for peace? I do. But that starts with each one of us. We've got to extend it. And the last thing is to celebrate it. Which I know probably feels a little bit hard right now. We're not in a mood to celebrate much of anything, are we? And yet I look at this woman who carries all of this pain with her. And when she sees Jesus, with adoration she serves him. With, with delight she can't stop kissing his feet. With generosity, she, she pours out her most prized possession. And with complete abandon, she weeps. I think at first, with sorrow, with pain, but I'm convinced by the end, it was with sheer joy. For she had been set free. And so she worships. In church, what else is there left for us to do? Let's pray together. Gracious Father, help us to receive your love, unworthy though we are. You make us worthy by your grace. And Holy Spirit, free us from our shame. Protect us from ourselves, from our isolation and fear. Set us free and root these things deep within our hearts. And never let go. And Lord Jesus, together we receive your love. Empower us to extend it to others, for there are challenges ahead. And be our joy, even in our worry. Be our hope, even in the unknown. And in all things, give us your presence in worship and delight. For we celebrate you now. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned Shall ever be how marvelous, how wonderful is 
my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them His very own. He bore my burden to Calvary and so As we prepare to go, I wanted to finish today with the words of St. Patrick. The words of his prayer, and this prayer has been, it's been made into a song, and it's a beautiful song of sending, especially as we pray over ourselves as well as each other. And so these words are meant to, to carry you, to go with you, and to remind you that as we go, we carry Christ with us. So in your callings this week, in the places you find yourself, separated by three feet, of course, right? In those places, I invite you to carry Christ with you. So let's sing these words as our benediction in song. As I rise, strength of God, go before Lift me up, and as I wake, eyes of God, look upon, be my side. Sing as I wait, as I wait. God, satisfy and sustain as I hear voice of God, lead me on, be my guide, be my guide above and below me, before and behind me. In every eye that sees me 
Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me. Christ be all around me. As I go, hand of God, my defense by my side. As I rest, breath of God, fall upon. to have you with us. If you are a family with kids, there are resources on the website and via email that we've created for you during this season. Please be sure to check the weekly update, our Facebook page, and ChristCommunityKC.org resources for links to family devotionals, videos, activities, and so much more. Now, as we go off to our various vocations and callings, would you please receive this benediction? And even while you are at home, I ask that you raise a hand as a symbol of receiving God's blessing upon your continued worship this week. Our benediction comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. <laughs>